welcome to A Question of Faith. My name is Tanya Willow, and for the next hour, what we're going to do is examine faith and the role that it plays in people's lives. And to help us do that, we've assembled a rather distinct and uh, very distinguished panel that just to introduce them. To my, re to my left is Reverend Anita Farber, who's locally here in Canton, and also uh, Rabbi William Hamilton. And right over to my right is uh, Dr. Ed Pointner, and also Thomas McGuire, Father Thomas McGuire. I want to thank you all for coming along and kind of looking at this question. I would assume from a religious perspective, since this is where we're coming from. What I'd like to ask first, and see, you can all just comment if you like, um, exactly what is faith for all of you? And since you're coming from different places, is it different for all of you? Is it a question of bringing God into the picture? What is faith for most of you? Well, maybe let me just say what I believe biblically it is described for us in the book of Hebrews 11.1, 1, where it says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Uh, it is something that God gives. We, we all, what we call, we have faith, we believe in something, we trust something. And there is a natural ability to have that. But to believe in the true and the living God, he has to give that faith. No man has that. And that's what when Paul preached, and he mentioned it in Romans, he said, faith comes by hearing, and hearing the word of God. In other words, faith has to come to us, that faith by which we really believe that God is and seek him. Uh, that would be the biblical definition I would go with. Okay, that's, uh, how is that relevant in our daily lives then? You know, how can we bring that into, what, what is it, seeing, seeing or believing something that there's yet no evidence for, is that? Uh, well, uh, it's more than that. Very often, I, I think Soren Kierkegaard way back uh, tried to define faith as a leap in, in the dark and you trust there's somewhere a hand that catches you, but really not. Faith is very, very logical. If we really know and understand who God is, then it's very easy to trust him. And uh, so obviously, faith is, is, is a is doctrines, is truth, is a revelation from God that we believe. And in that which we believe, you take a woman like just yesterday, I had to see somebody where the husband got quite seriously hurt. And as I left, the lady mentioned, she said, well, pastor, I, I really feel at peace and I don't know why. It's so upsetting. And he could lose his job, only a young man. But again, what she experienced is what scripture says, that we ought to be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let our request be made known unto God, and the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep our hearts and minds. So God grants to his people a, a peace of, of, emo, of emotional stability, the heart, as well as the intellectual, the mind. Why? Because scripture also says, and the rabbi will agree with me, you take Psalm 23, for instance. Well, there are several areas of life that the psalmist faces. There is a tranquil period when he is beside the still waters. There is the dark period, the terrifying one, is in the valley of shadow and death, and then he eats his meal amongst his enemies, and yet he says, goodness and mercy shall persecute me. That's what the Hebrew word almost means, to follow me all the days of my life. And in that sense, God ministers peace to his people, even in difficult situations, because they know he's in charge and they trust him. I, I uh, agree with, uh, with the, certainly with the, the interpretation of, of Psalm 23. Uh, and I uh, would just like to add, I think, that uh, to me, uh, faith is a very personal thing. Uh, I don't think we can define it in a global or a universal sense. I think everybody has their own personal uh, approach to a belief, uh, and it has a varying uh, strength, I think, for, for each individual, depending on their own personal uh, beliefs and convictions. Of course, they can never be empiricized. Of course, they can never be made logical and, uh, and rational and, and be explained completely uh, from one person to the next. Uh, but it's something that is experienced uh, in the Jewish tradition, uh, in the Jewish faith, uh, as something unique to everybody uh, and that everybody is on their own path uh, toward that faith and that it can't necessarily find uh, any sort of uh, source uh, in something that everybody can naturally link, link themselves with. Uh, it is unique and personal for each individual. So for you then, it's okay for each person to pursue faith or pursue God in his own way, whatever he feels or deems appropriate for that particular individual? Well, I think that that's important. I think there are also the tradition sets forth uh, 
for what is seen within the framework of, of say, Jewish tradition and, uh, and what is without, outside that framework. Uh, I think it's interesting to note that the uh, first of the Ten Commandments uh, that uh, we commonly call the Ten Commandments, the uh, commandment that God is God, uh, uh, is a commandment of faith. Uh, it is, in fact, saying that faith is important, and faith is an integral part of Jewish tradition, but it does not necessarily talk about how you get, uh, go about arriving at that conviction, at that uh, awareness of faith, what kind of intensity you must have in that faith. Uh, so the parameter is defined as faith in God and the recognition of God as the God who brought the Israelites, in this case, out of Egypt. But it doesn't necessarily, uh, and so you can't necessarily believe in anything you want, uh, but uh, by the same token, you're not told exactly how you've got to get there. Is that your job as clergy to sort of bring that faith forward for, for people, to have them look at uh, that possibility of different types of what's appropriate for them, their faith, and bring that forward and bring that faith out? Mm -hmm. Or not really? Or I'm not sure I understand your question, partly because what I heard you saying um, was that faith is very in, involved in doctrinal issues and revealed testimony and revealed religion and that there is a logic to that whole system. And what I heard you saying, Bill, was something somewhat different, that given the parameters of the, of the Jewish tradition, there's a lot of leeway. Uh, and in my tradition, uh, there's really no place for doctrinal issues at all. And the presumption is that the holy reveals itself all the time. Uh, it, it revealed itself in the past, it reveals itself in the present, it reveals itself in the, in the birds that sing and in the hope that emerges in the face of devastation. And uh, there's, there's not a once and for only revelation. So that what we would be called to do, and I know you haven't shared your perception yet, would be different depending on uh, how we understood the faith that we're trying to cultivate. But uh, I think that, that that idea of being cultivators uh, and helping people bring to fruition mm -hmm. uh, what has begun to grow within them is probably something that we all do in some way. So you would, you would agree that you're a cultivator as well? Uh, I would. I think that uh, two things uh, ultimately help lead someone uh, to faith, uh, their own personal experiences uh, and their contact with uh, uh, the various teachings of our tradition and also their contact with specific individuals, uh, people of faith, uh, mm -hmm. to learn from role models and to, to be able to uh, uh, be exposed to people that have a heartfelt, uh, you know, profound conviction, and through that, uh, I am I see myself as, as a cultivator. Father, do you see yourself as a cultivator? Well, I was going to go back and uh, uh, perhaps say again in, in different way that we have different uh, levels of faith, mm -hmm. um, and we're speaking of faith on those different levels. Uh, when we speak of that blind leap of faith, uh, someone there to catch us. Uh, perhaps someone there or something there uh, that gives meaning to our life, uh, what we would call God from the religious perspective, uh, is that very fundamental, if you want to say, simplistic level of faith, which, uh, as I say, we would, we would all hope could be a part of our lives, a part of our people's lives, so that uh, in the good and the bad, uh, this this God, this, this uh, source of meaning for them and for us is always present. And then I think you, you move from that to, uh, uh, to doctrinal levels of faith in certain uh, denominations. Uh, every Sunday we uh, say that we proclaim our faith and we are proclaiming a doctrinal faith. I think simply by gathering for Sunday worship or for Saturday worship, one is saying apart from the doctrine to a degree uh, that uh, we have gathered because of our faith in God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then through that profession of faith, through the um, uh, beliefs of our individual faiths or religions or denominations, um, we would have um, a particular doctrinal or uh, 
principles of faith. So then does it matter which doctrine we, t we embrace as long as we have something out there that can strengthen us through emergency times or times that may be difficult? Well, I think that uh, obviously all of us here and, and millions around the world uh, have all seen themselves through times of crisis and times of great joy uh, based on their faith, which is uh, right here very dramatically different one to another in the sense of the doctrinal faith. So um, in that sense, the belief in God, um, that simplistic fundamental faith, I suppose one could say, as long as that's present, it doesn't, uh, the doctrinal is secondary to the simple faith in God. But I think one, once one understands that people have been born and raised in certain uh, faith traditions, then yes, what that person believes coming from that faith tradition makes a difference. So then, but then when you say you believe in God, I, I, when, you say, when we say God, are you on a common ground as far as that definition? Is this a, mm -hmm. a, a, a sort of... Um, like yes or no, I guess. Yeah, yeah. For, for me, what I, what I see to some extent, is, is especially for you, Reverend, is the idea of being a sort of um, a God that if you don't do things in a certain way or have things happen, there's a sort of punishing God that, um, mm -hmm. that you know, either you follow this particular set of doctrine or you will pay severe consequences come the time of your demise. Yeah, I was just going to say <clears throat> the very fact God demands faith, like uh, all people have a God, either the God of revelation as he revealed himself in nature, in scripture, and through Christ ultimately, or a god of imagination, and the god of imagination may have much of even truthful trimmings with it, as uh, Father said here, you know, wherever you've been brought up. But one of the reasons, and the scripture is full of it, if we take the scripture for the ultimate revelation of God left for man, that yes, God will judge man. Why will he judge him? Because he doesn't accept certain things. He has laid out a certain path. Uh, if I may just speak about the history of Israel, which to the rabbi is very familiar. Uh, God gave unconditional promises to Israel, but he also gave conditional ones. And when they didn't meet the conditions, he punished them, and he punished them severely. He scattered them. The northern tribes almost completely disappeared. And then the 70 years of captivity that J uh, Judah had to go through, although he brought them back. So uh, when, we, when we look at the God of Revelation, we have to look at his nature. And I would maybe say, not to contradict uh, uh, Father here, but... Doctrinal is very important because, again, in Scripture it says, well, how can we call on him of whom we have not heard? How can we believe in him of whom we know nothing? You know, that's where I would reject Kierkegaard's faith, certainly that leap in the blind and, you know, hopefully somebody's there and catch it as a real personal God. And he has told us what he is like and what he wants and what he dislikes, just like we tell people, that's what I like. The interesting thing is, you know, we tell God he cannot like what he likes, but I can make the rules in my house. You know, if you come to my house, you don't do this, that, and the other. But God cannot do that. That's the way mostly he is approached. So in other words, everything goes, and God just has to accept it. And I would say scripture certainly does not allow this to us. He has set his standards and his rules. The just shall live by faith. And then we come again back to the issue. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For those that come to him, Scripture says, must first of all believe that he is and that he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. So there are rules. But you have a real specific key. Pardon? You have a real specific key. A real specific key. Yeah, yeah. yeah. To me, I'd like to know by what criterion you choose the Christian Scripture and or the Hebrew Scripture yeah. uh, and discard the uh, scriptures of the, of the world that also uh, God has spoken to the people through. But, but he really hasn't. <clears throat> you see, if by what take, criteria do you by, discern by that God by, has not by, spoken by through those scripture others? Itself, by scripture itself. Like, very simple. If I were to give each one of you a piece of string that long and a, and a pair of scissors, and I say, all right, what I want you to do is I want you to cut me exactly seven and a half inches. Not six, not eight, seven and a half. So you would kind of say, well, you know, six and seven and a half inches, and you would do it, and we all would cut it. And now each one of us would argue his point that my cut is those seven and a half inches. But how do I go to stop the argument and prove who has it? Well, I have to take a rule that we all agree on, 
right? And that's already, I think, where we have problems. We don't agree that's on the, the same rule. That's what I'm asking, but is how you, you see, chose that Okay, rule. so I'll just say where I would come from. I take both Old and New Testament as God's revelation to men, and in these are the rules, the faith, and all described. And if we go beyond that, then we go by imagination. And there's plenty of it around. I that mean, seems to me incredible hubris, considering all the peoples of the world who have revelations they believe uh, of God mm -hmm. made to other peoples in other times. Mm -hmm. And I'm not hearing by what authority uh, you would discard all the other scriptures of the world. <clears throat> okay, we could go back, for instance, to the fifth book of Moses. In it was, first of all, laid down that for the Old Testament, a true prophet from God had to be number one a Hebrew. There was already a great distinction. God chose Israel above all people because he is sovereign. He knows what he does. His great glory rests that he has mercy on whom he has mercy. That was his revelation to Moses. So the Israelites knew a true prophet, first of all, had to be a Hebrew, had to be from their own people. But even amongst them, they had false prophets. Mm -hmm. And they were being checked out by what they said, if it came true or not, or if it was in line with the word of God. And if it wasn't, they were to stone this man because he was trying to take him away from the true and the living God. And this, this is going right through, you know, which ultimately Christ claimed the same thing, but I'm just gonna stay now with the Old Testament uh, for a moment. Well, the, where that's the way God started off, and that's the way he kept it. He's not contradictory to his own nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, about that, I, I just wanna add that I, I, I think that first of all, we all have faith uh, in the whole proposition of faith. And that when what we have in common, what we share in common around this table, is that we are all people of faith uh, who have a deep and abiding respect for other people of faith and anyone else that uh, strives for faith in life. Mm -hmm. uh, what where we differ, of course, is uh, is that whenever the nature of faith is that whenever one has a strong conviction uh, and a passion that leads one uh, down the road uh, of a certain faith, it's very hard to uh, to leave open possibilities for believing other things, having mm -hmm. convictions in, in, in different things. So if one uh, has a very strong belief in the Hebrew Scriptures, uh, it's very hard to accept uh, the uh, belief uh, that in, say, the New Testament or uh, any other religious, Quran. the Quran or any other religious uh, mm -hmm. uh, writing that deviates from the Hebrew Scriptures. Nonetheless, the fact that the faith exists, okay, and the, and the commitment on the part of uh, the Christian, the Buddhist, the, the Muslim, whoever it is, uh, the intensity of that commitment is something, provided that it is not uh, destructive to, or doesn't do violence to uh, our principles, mm -hmm. is something that we can respect a great deal. Uh, not necessarily that we respect the teaching mm -hmm. uh, of, of another mm -hmm. uh, a great deal, because that if, it, if we did, it would probably be our, we would embrace it as mm -hmm. our own, uh, but that we, again, respect the yeah. individual of faith, the, the, the human being of faith. I think I'd it's like, important. Correct me if I'm wrong, but my sense is that you and I are on similar territory in that I know what traditions help me understand my relationship to God, and I think uh, which will help my faith community. But that doesn't mean that I think they are the only traditions that are helpful for all of the world. Mm -hmm. And my understanding of Judaism is that everybody doesn't need to become Jewish in order to gain access to God. Uh, and so in that, um, we can appreciate the religiosity and the authentic faith of other people and other traditions. What I hear you saying is that that doesn't make any sense in your frame of reference, and, and I haven't heard from you, but mm -hmm. my understanding from may, your frame may, of reference may I is correct that something? Very I respect everybody on a personal level because I really believe everyone is a creature of God and is accountable to God. So I am not looking down on anybody for no matter what they do. If they want to pray to a stone, fine. I understand that they would do that because Scripture tells us that after the fall, man became perverted in his thinking. And you know New Testament scripture clearly teaches that the heart of natural man is perverted, his mind is at enmity with God, it's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. So we have already an opposition to God to begin with. You're saying that anybody who thinks other than... Everybody, that everybody. Thinks other than how you think... No, no, not speech. than I think. Leave me even out. Let me just say what scripture says about natural man. 
It says about natural man, they are by nature, if we take the New Testament teaching, they are children of God's anger. Everybody. That's where they part. That's where we begin. By very nature, we, we are born with a sin nature. We, don't, we are not called sinners because we sin, but we sin because we are born sinners. That's and what that's Scripture says, crystal clear. From I, I know that, I, you know. Yeah. And again, you believe and, and you go on, that's fine. But what I would say is that when it comes to Scripture, you would be in opposition to what Scripture teaches. If we can take Scripture for the measuring well, stick, this scripture is the point. I think Scripture teaches lots of different things, and it depends on your particular lens. Mm. I think yeah. that the Scripture teaches that God created the world, and the world is good, and God created the creatures of the world, and they were good too. Yeah. Until the fall. Very good. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. I think that uh, another part, another thing here might be to to go back to the idea that faith is a gift. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And most of us, uh, whatever our religion might be, most of us receive that gift of faith through our birth mm -hmm. and through our family. Uh, clearly, there were those who, in later life. Uh, convert to a different faith for whatever reason. Uh, for some that would just be this particular faith seems to make more sense, or for some it would be a more intellectual religion or whatever. But basically most of us are born with the faith, we die with the faith with which we were born. It's come, it's, it's gone through a lot of changes, but most people who are born Jewish die Jewish. Those who were born, born Catholic die Catholic, the Christian, Christian, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And uh, because we are raised in that faith, um, uh, I think we, uh, we tend to, um, we would see that faith as, as the, the right faith or the true faith. And we come mm -hmm. to learn it as best we can yeah. and then to put that faith forward, at least for ourselves, as the faith, the understanding of God, the understanding of life which allows me, with my background, to, to live this life well and hopefully uh, to live this life in such a way that one day I will be with the God whom I have envisioned all my life, that mm -hmm. being in heaven. Mm -hmm. And then because of our doctrinal differences of how that faith is expressed, even among the Christian denominations, we have these, these uh, different nuances and different beliefs. But if, gift, if faith is a gift, uh, then I think uh, most of us uh, appreciate that gift and, uh, and want to defend and, and, and put it for others. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, would, yeah, I, would, I was just uh, to ag agree with that and, and notice, um, for me, the issue of, of gift and graciousness is really probably the quintessential dimension of my experience of God. Mm -hmm is that God is incredibly gracious and the, the, the bounty of the earth and the, the wonders in my life and the ways in which uh, opportunity and, and creativity uh, manifest itself are astounding. And every experience I have had uh, that I would call holy is one of, of graciousness and giftedness. And so those are the things I see when I read scripture. Yeah, I just want to say one word about the idea of faith as a, as a gift. I think it's a beautiful idea. Uh, but I want to clarify, uh, as a Jew, my, my position with regard to faith. I think it's important to be clear about it. And that is that uh, while a Jew accepts that gift uh, and sees the value of that gift, not every Jew uh, need necessarily uh, embrace that gift for, uh, to the same extent in order to be a good Jew. Mm -hmm. uh, a big part of Jewish life has to do with observance and behavior much more than it may have to do with, uh, with faith, much more than it may be based or rooted in a profound faith in God. Uh, one can be a very committed, religious, observant Jew uh, and really have a, a serious question about any faith in God at all. Uh, there are such, uh, such instances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so that so much of uh, Jewish lifestyle is rooted in, uh, in behavioral uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, patterns and, and, and customs and rituals that, uh, that faith isn't always at the forefront of everyone's mind 
uh, when they light a Hanukkah menorah or when they observe a particular uh, custom. Mm -hmm. it's a, that's the nature of uh, the dichotomy or, the, or the, the balance, I would say, the tension between faith and, and observance and practice in Judaism. Are you saying the rituals are more important than the actual belief or faith following through on the traditions is more important? Many of the rabbinic teachings are such uh, that uh, one is penalized much more severely for uh, not properly adhering to Jewish practice, Jewish uh, ritual practice, whether it's keeping kosher, eating, uh, keeping the Jewish dietary laws, observing the Sabbath, uh, whatever it may be. Penalized by God? Penalized by the community in some cases, and perhaps ultimately by God. Depends on whether the uh, transgression is between uh, God and man, or, or between man and his fellow man. That is ultimately has to do with the the, 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 the punishment. But in other words, the, the Jewish tradition is a lot more concrete in its definition of uh, what a good Jew is by the behavior and the ritual than it is by uh, what. Uh, beliefs and convictions an individual mm -hmm. might, uh, might harbor. I'll tell you what I'm hearing. I'm hearing uh, parts of this, the dogma that each of you present, and there seems to be this, this great punishing factor in there. You know, you, you follow the rituals or else you're going to get it. You believe in the scriptures and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're going to fire and brimstone, it's going to happen to you. And for me, when I look at this, and I think when I, I didn't wanna, say anything I know like you, that. Haven't, you haven't said anything like that yet. Um, um, I don't intend to kick me under the table if I do. <laughs> um, so for me, I'm, for, I think for most average people that are just um, out there trying to make a living and get through the day, um, that that type of talk is in many ways very unattractive. Uh, maybe it's great to um, you know, do the right thing so maybe you can get by or you know, not get punished. Mm -hmm. But for me, I don't know that that is necessarily a path towards spirituality. It would seem to me the more spiritual you are, the less need there is for punishment. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very closed-minded people are the first ones to suck it to you when you don't do what they want. Mm -hmm. um, but as you grow spiritual and you become more spiritually aware, it seems like that type of need to be angry, punishing, and beat on someone for not doing what you want um, seems to me in contradiction with something that we might describe as God, that God would be someone or a being yeah. that would be much more forgiving. Well, in some and, ways, it's like way. children. When you teach mm -hmm. children um, what the proper codes are for behavior and it, so that people can live together and be respectful toward one another. And hopefully, as they mature, they internalize those rules and learn that you don't take somebody else's things uh, and you don't hit somebody to get your way. Mm -hmm. um, because that's destructive of some things that are essential in human life. Yeah. Uh, and I think that even though I, I disagree with, with the, those positions about um, issues of punishment being important, I think it's, um, it, it's very important to understand that the religious person in an, is, is trying with, on any of these paths to become as as close to God, to walk in the ways of God. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. And that means learning the ways of God so that Where do you, you find can them? walk in them. Well, so well, it's, I, it's yeah. punishment. Is, I, think, I think you're overstating the case. Yeah, in some I, way. I also don't want to be misunderstood. In other words, the Jew, Jew does not uh, observe the Jewish tradition because he walks around in fear of being punished. Uh, I use that as an example of uh, demonstrating to you uh, where, when you go from the top down, when you look at the overall religious authority, uh, the rabbis were, were very concerned about behavior, much more so uh, than necessarily uh, faith. But the typical Jew observes uh, what he observes, not because he walks around in fear of being punished, but because he wants to preserve uh, what his ancestors did, right. and he wants to continue, yeah. and he also wants to lead a good life. So the it, control is the important thing. You see, in that what, case, it seems like the control is you follow the old traditions the way. So it's not so much what you think is irrelevant, but as long as that... that no, no, I wouldn't even... Uh, that, in other there. words, in, in, in that one... In, if, if somebody wants to preserve their, their ancestors' tradition, yes, that's the case. If somebody has uh, not uh, had ancestors that were Jewish at all, uh, to make, uh, selects Judaism uh, by choice, uh, becomes, uh, becomes a Jew, uh, has no reason to preserve... Uh, an ancestral faith simply uh, observes and uh, practices rituals because they believe they can be a better human being and ultimately uh, live a more fulfilling life. Now, Anita, oh, Anita had mentioned uh, the 
the way children learn, and uh, that hopefully by the time they have reached uh, certainly adulthood, they would uh, uh, do the right thing because it is the right thing in order society and, and people live in harmony with one another. But one of the ways that children learn right from wrong uh, is that there is a punishment sometimes attached uh, from the parents. Mm -hmm. That might no television or no dessert or whatever it might be. Those parents love that child. Uh, and uh, they're punishing uh, not uh, uh, to hurt, but to train and, and to improve the child, to make the child a better child. And I think sometimes we can, when we think of God, and uh, there was a great tendency uh, for a while, I think, to say that exclusively, almost, that God is love. And which is certainly true, um, but part of love, um, parental love, I think, is the best example. Part of love is the need to discipline love at it. times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this God who is love is also just mm -hmm. uh, in all justice. Mm -hmm. And uh, when one would violate, in whatever ways, um, God's justice, uh, then there is, uh, this, there is this need of this loving God being true to the fact that he is also justice, uh, must in some way, um, uh, if you want to use the word punish, uh, the person. But the person has already punished himself by his or her actions. God is simply declaring, if you will, if we're speaking of final judgment, that uh, God is only declaring that what you have done contrary to my laws I've given you and, and the moral code, deserves what I, in justice, must now say to you. Uh, so, uh, mm. The punishment I think of, I guess, is estrangement. And that comes with the act, that when one does something that's profoundly destructive, hurtful, uh, one is estranged, estranged from, from the divine, estranged from the community. Mm -hmm. uh, and to me, that, that's the punishment. It, it, it happens even as you're doing it. I think that was a quick, we want to take a quick break and I'm going to come back. But I'd like to talk about that connectedness of religion because sometimes, I Anita, mean, you feel estranged without really doing any violation at all. There's a sense of uh, unconnectedness mm -hmm. out there for people who haven't really necessarily done anything of uh, any kind of violent action. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about that a little bit. And also I want to talk about all of you and um, what it is to serve God in the way that you see is appropriate to serve God. And is that a large task? I know, uh, Father, you were late today because you had maybe something going on, emergency mm -hmm. happening, and it seems to me it's a, it's a tough calling or something that would be appropriate for everybody. And even if it were, something someone really has to examine before they get into it because it sounds like it's mm -hmm. not the easiest job to, mm -hmm. uh, to take on. So what I'd like to do is take a, a quick break and come it's back. It's not a job. <laughs> it's a calling. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll discuss that too, the calling. I thought you were going to say it's not a job, it's an adventure. <laughs> so we'll take it on. Yeah, true. All right. We'll, um, we'll, t we'll take a, a short break and we'll come back and we'll talk about that too. Well, stay with us. Everyone makes mistakes, Matthew. <laughs> Don't pay any attention to the other children. For this bright six-year-old, the ABCs have never been as simple as ABC. Where do you go when you're different from the other kids? He got help at a center for learning disabilities. They got help from the United Way. All because the United Way got help from you. The United Way. It brings out the best in all of us. I don't know if you'll remember me, but I'll never forget you. I'm Mr. Signorelli's daughter. I didn't think about what would happen if he went into cardiac arrest. I didn't realize that at 6 a.m., a nurse would call the shots and save his life. If you have the smarts and the guts to study biology, chemistry, anatomy, and psychology, call 1-800-962-NURSE. If caring were enough, anyone could be a nurse. Strings. Branford Marsalis on the horn. Paul Schaefer on keys. Carly Simon on lead. There are a lot of different parts to play in the American Red Cross. Play 
play your part. I was going to take a job with an engineering firm in New York. I got a better offer. I'm building schools overseas with the Peace Corps. The pace is a little slower than New York, but here I'm getting grassroots experience I couldn't get anywhere else. The way I look at it, the world can wait two years for another 40-story smoked glass high-rise. Peace Corps, the toughest job you'll ever love. Faith, all the good arguments starts happening when we're on the break, you know, and everybody starts <laughs> opening up. But the thing that brought up the conversation while we were on the break, and you folks missed it, it was great. Uh, <laughs> what, we, what we were discussing was the idea, of, we were trying to say what we are going to discuss when we came back, and the idea of, um, that we seemed to pop into was, you know, you were discussing, Anita, your frustration that the God that seems to be defined here and uh, is this masculine male God that sort of sits in a throne and, you know, points at you're doing the right thing, you're doing the wrong thing, you're following the rituals, and you are not accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, so there you go. I mean, there seems to be like this pointing, angry sort of fellow sitting up there. For me, and I, I don't follow the, that there's such an intellectual deity that may pass judgment on us and, and sort of do that. But for you, that's very, very so. Mm -hmm. Anita, just to get clear, because I think it's, it's, and then you can discuss it, yeah. for you, what is God? Is God an intellectual deity that passes judgments on us, that's a male deity, or what is God for you? Well, when I answer, I'm answering for myself, sure, because in absolutely. my tradition there's a lot of encouragement for people to experience God in whatever way a uh, guy comes to them. Mm -hmm. But for me, God is, God is the, the spirit of creativity and life and becoming that, that uh, is the universe and makes the universe and calls the universe forward and we are part of that ongoing process uh, and so there's a spirit of life that is that is greater than all of the physical materializations and all the people but the spirit of, of God moves in everything it moves in, in Bill and in me and in the table and uh, it just in my experience throbs through the universe and calls us to constant becoming and it's a very life-loving, life-infusing, healing presence. Uh, and I want to be close to it, and I uh, want to honor it where uh, I encounter it. So it sounds more like almost like a verb, right? Yeah. You know, that's it. Yeah. That's good. You know, more than the, the noun, mm -hmm. of embodiment of something. Mm -hmm. So is that what it is for you? More of that mm -hmm. than the actual embodiment of a being or a, or a deity, so to speak? Yes, but that doesn't mean that there isn't more to the divine than simply the physical It might be universe. beyond articulation. Yeah, but, know? It's, but I don't think of it as being separate. Julianne of Norwich, who was a Christian mystic in the 14th century, said something that I found very moving. Between us and God, there is no wrath and there is no forgiveness because there is no between. She couldn't be more wrong according to scripture. Well, she disagreed with you that's and okay. she was an abbess. It's, that's right, and she is free to do so. That's right, and I am too. <laughs> yeah. See, the thing is, I think I may become on a little bit strong. I don't mean to, and but one thing I know that nobody can force the true faith on anybody because we don't have it. It's up for God to give it. Mm -hmm. and you see, he already in Psalm, nine, yeah, in Psalm 19, he said, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows forth his handiwork. Day unto day and night unto night utter speech. Their language is gone forth into all areas. In other words, there is what is called a general revelation of God where people that are created in his image, when they look at it knowing that everything had an existence and a creator, they're already impressed with that. And Paul precisely picks on that up in the book of Romans. He says, and the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Now this God that we seek, he has his wrath revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness that man hold by suppressing the truth. For that which may clearly be seen and understood in what is made, his eternal power in Godhead. Therefore man is without excuse. In God's point of view, man is without excuse by the very environment in which he lives that is a testimony to God. But man, because of his sinfulness, will not bow even to that testimony. So he has to suppress even that truth. But God has made it known to him. That's why there is absolutely no atheist. Because if a man only slightly thinks in his heart, maybe there is a God. Maybe I should 
pursue it. And then he says, ah, hogwash, nobody else does it. His own heart already has condemned him like scripture says. I think the better question to ask the atheist is, <clears throat> tell me what God it is in whom you don't believe. Because I know many people who call themselves atheists because they want it to be clear that they don't believe in the angry bearded man who lives in the sky and shoots thunderbolts. That doesn't mean they don't have a profound sense of the holy. It means that they don't believe in the Hallmark God or <laughs> whatever it is um, that is in common parlance and they're, what they're responding to is that stereotype. But I found many of them to be profoundly religious people. Oh, yeah. See, the point, this is where we come back on, religious. Well, there's all kinds of religions, and people are sincere, and they are good people. But the bottom line is, and, and, and we all have a presupposition, but the bottom line is, if God is who he is, how he has said, then that's the way the show is going to be run, whether you like it or not. That's not the issue. If God says, this is my law, you break it, you go to hell, that's all there is to it. And he has the power, that's why he is God. See, man is in rebellion. We are in rebellion. We don't really want to submit to what God has to say. Or we, we are choosing, we cafeteria style, you know. Well, we come in and we say, well, I take this law. That suits me and that suits my background and my makeup. But you can't do it when God but offers But you are. It. You're reading it and you're saying, my reading is the way God meant it to be read. And I know the truth and you don't. No, I'm not saying... To me, that's arrogance. Well, if it's arrogant, then let it be arrogant. But, but I don't it. think that you know what God meant when God wrote that, if in fact God did write okay, it. Okay, give I me another believe. presupposition. I have kept Jesus back in reference to my friend, the rabbi here, because he probably will not go into the New Testament, okay? But Jesus, even if we were to assume he was not the Son of God, which he was, the Messiah, but whenever he came into an argument with all the religious people of his day, what was his resource? He always said, what says scripture? In other words, he, he, he totally bound himself to the revelation of his father, mm -hmm. God, in the Old Testament that this was given to the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. That was every time, no matter who attacked him, whether it was the Pharisees or mm -hmm. the Sadducees or, or whoever, whatever group it was, mm -hmm. he says, well, what says scripture? And then he had them quoted. And if they were right, he said, hey, you're mm -hmm. not far from it. If they were not right, like he said, for instance, the Sadducees who didn't believe in the resurrection, he said very plainly, he said, you always err. You always wrong. Why? You don't know scripture. Well, they boast they would know scripture. They go by it. But he says you don't know scripture because he's the God of the living. He's the father. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So there, there is a certain dogmatism about scripture, yes. Even Psalm 1, that beautiful psalm, makes a separation between the godly and the ungodly. He says, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, who does not sit in the seat of the scornful, or walks in the way of the sinner, but his delight is in the law of God, and therein he meditates day and night. The wicked are not so. They like chaff. They be blown away. They will not stand in the congregation of the righteous. See, it's God who's calling the shots. But and you're, you're not being them. responsive to what I said, which is that, yes, those words are written there, yeah. but how you interpret them is not necessarily how God interprets them. It's how one man interprets them. Well, it's not just one man. There's many. Would if, if we were to go just with the Old Testament, let me put the rabbi on the spot for a minute. In a good way. Sure. Go ahead, Bill. You, you, you believe the Old Testament, right? The scriptures. I hope so. The, the Hebrew Bible. The yes, Hebrew Bible. Yeah. All right. That's, yeah. what I, that's why I said Old Testament. I will not go into well, the new. I yeah. just but go to the 22 that you have or the 39 that we have. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, in this, how much would you say God revealed himself as one that loves those that keep his law and one that punishes his law. Would you say that from Genesis to Malachi, I mean, your, your binding is different. You have the historical books at the end. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, but you know what I mean? That the whole scripture, yes. that the prophets, the law, um, and the writings, mm -hmm. would you not say that they're all thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly full of, of God's righteous judgments and his declaration of his anger uh, for when things are not being done his way and punishment that is to come? Would I would you not say I, that? I, in response, I would say that the, the this is my answer to the yeah. original question uh, about uh, the kind of God that that I find in our Hebrew scriptures. Uh, that is a God of justice indeed. Mm -hmm. uh, there are numerous instances uh, throughout the scripture of God's uh, justice. There is also uh, numerous. Uh, uh, numerous, numerous instances throughout uh, the Hebrew scripture, uh, examples of God's mercy. Absolutely. And, and they are in tension. However you uh, understand each of them, mm -hmm. 
okay, I think is ultimately very subjective. One of the strengths of uh, the <coughs> thousands of years of tradition that's come down through the Jewish interpretations and mm -hmm. commentaries on scripture is that uh, we have come to understand that, that nobody uh, can agree on interpretations of, uh, of uh, just about any uh, passage or uh, uh, section of, of scripture. I think there are basic messages that come mm -hmm. through uh, and I don't think that you can read anything you want into the Bible. Uh, but I think that uh, it's important to understand that, that Judaism sees a tension between the justice and the mercy that, that mm -hmm. God uh, embodies in the Hebrew scriptures. I see personally uh, a, that that biblical God uh, mm -hmm. of uh, the Hebrew scriptures ha is still very much alive and well today, oh, and that, that that tension still exists, mm -hmm. but it is a God that is a very personal, uh, concerned, right. deeply concerned God with, with each and every one of our lives. It's not a God, you know, one of the problems, uh, Nita, when you were talking, I, I agreed with uh, much of what you said, but one of the problems that I, I worry about sometimes when we talk about uh, God as a, a verb, mm -hmm. God as a, a, as a force uh, of being, uh, is that we tend to push God off of it. We, we depersonalize him. We put him in the cosmos. We make him a force in the universe. And, uh, and as much as you tried, I think you said clearly... Uh, we don't make him him. <laughs> or an it. Uh, the, as much as you tried, uh, I think is the it to say that, uh, that, that God is very much uh, you know, concerned and, and close and, and you want to honor him uh, in, in any way that... that, that or, uh, however you see God, you want to honor God in any way you can. Uh, I think that it's, it's important that to, to understand, uh, at least I feel, that the God of, uh, of the scriptures uh, is a God that, that does have, have the, uh, a lot of uh, mercy coming through. Uh, to me, the very first thing, uh, the very first uh, uh, thing God did after uh, he looked at uh, creation of man, uh, is, is saying that, uh, uh, or Adam, I would say, uh, he said he's lonely. It's not good, good for him to be alone. Uh, who knows? Maybe that's because God himself uh, uh, is, is very cognizant of, of uh, being a little bit lonely in the world. Uh, and maybe uh, it's because uh, God himself is uh, very much eager for people to uh, respond to God and to, to, to understand that, uh, that he is concerned and, and close and imminent and not just transcendent and in the cosmos. But uh, I think there are a lot of things you can read through the, the Hebrew scriptures. What I'm going to do is we're going to come back and we'll we have to take a quick break and then we're going to come back and summarize the whole thing. I think we have a few minutes when we do come back. It's very difficult. It's a difficult question and, and the question of him and even the idea that for you, women don't even belong to servicing God. And, and I think that's true to some extent to the degree that women can serve God in the Catholic Church, too. And that's kind of a question that perhaps we might look at and bring up some of that as well as to where, where we belong. Yeah, we'll talk about that. We'll take a quick break and then, um, and then we'll discuss that matter as well. Just a fraction of what we spend dining out could help pick up the tab for a good cause. A small part of what we spend on sports could help keep our community in shape. Or some of our time on the phone could help answer society's problems. Won't you get involved? By giving 5% of your income and volunteering 5 hours per week, you can really help your community. This year, make it your goal to give 5. What you get back is immeasurable. Hi, welcome back to A Question of Faith, and we're examining the question of faith. And uh, before we took the break, we just quickly looked at um, the role of women and what, what women can or aren't allowed to do. And, and I think what I'd like to bring into this question is the question of dogma. For me, sometimes I look at these different faiths, the, the importance of tradition and the role that that plays, or the um, literal translation of the scriptures, and some of the traditions associated with the Catholic Church, and I think for myself that sometimes that dogma can become very unspiritual or unreligious in a, almost in, in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd like you to sort of look at that question a little bit. And, mm -hmm. and even like the idea that, that women play such a small role and yet in the world women are the, women are the givers of life, so to speak. Women give birth. That's something that, that mm -hmm. men don't do. Mm -hmm. And also traditionally you find that women are very much 
in the background and unacknowledged for that contribution, but they are they they hold family together mm -hmm. and they hold a lot of the important elements together, but they seem to be um, either unable because of the laws in church mm -hmm. to give to these kinds of spiritual traditions, and that for me is kind of a turn off for me with religion mm -hmm. that that women are so unable and uh, to contribute religiously mm -hmm. to a lot of these the dogma mm -hmm. that's set forth in their religions. Before we maybe oh go ahead. Oh, well, you you mentioned something we all agree on that. Uh, men don't give birth. So, <laughs> well, we agreed on something we agreed tonight. On that. <laughs> uh, I, I suppose, uh, speaking uh, only from the, uh, the Catholic uh, the Church's uh, perspective, uh, the, the Church grew out of, uh, of a society, an age, in its beginning, that was certainly male-dominated. Uh, its structure was fashioned after a combination of the uh, Jewish faith and the Roman Empire, out of which it grew, and which at a in point of time uh, uh, replaced the, the empire. And uh, it has maintained, or has maintained for centuries, that basic uh, structure. And uh, I guess there has to be a distinction made between the, uh, the roles that women would be allowed to play, or anyone would be allowed to play in the church and uh, the access that anyone would have to God's grace, the church. Uh, and the second is clearly more important, that there are lots of uh, good holy women, uh, let's say, in heaven. And I don't think all the popes who eventually attained the power of the church are not in heaven. So they had the structure, uh, but not always uh, responded favorably to the access of God's grace that all of all men and women share it. Certainly the, the change for the Catholic Church uh, in the more public nature, or the more visible uh, role for women would come after the Vatican Council, uh, when women uh, and now uh, do play a, a very important role in the Church, clearly not to the degree that some women uh, and men uh, would like the, church, the women to play. Uh, women serve as uh, lectors, uh, proclaiming God's word. Uh, they serve as the uh, ministers of uh, the Eucharist to distribute the, the body of Christ to the people. Uh, as in, uh, probably for time immemorial, they have sort of run the parishes. They are the backbone of the uh, parishes. Uh, but uh, the, more, the most obvious exception uh, to the uh, role of women is that of the priesthood and that uh, the church uh, maintains its, uh, its, at the present time, its uh, clear teaching uh, that it was not in the mind of Christ uh, for women to uh, exercise this special ministry, uh, but only uh, for men. And uh, one thing I said, I think, on the break, uh, the role of women and, and in the scriptures, uh, that Christ was, was not anti-woman, uh, the scriptures are not anti-woman. Mm -hmm. uh, the first person to find the tomb empty was not Peter, was not John, but it was Mary Magdalene. She found the tomb empty. She's the one who was the first one to proclaim that you know, the Lord is risen. She goes to the, to the apostles, and then they come. Uh, so the church uh, and Christ himself clearly was not uh, anti-woman. Uh, but from the beginning, the churches believed that it was not Christ's intention uh, that uh, women exercise the role of priesthood within the church, and the church continues that uh, uh, teaching today. Tanya, I, I thought maybe uh, to come back what you had earlier said with dogma, which is really so important. Uh, let me put it this way. If there is a God, and if he has revealed himself, and that revelation is in scripture, and we go to that. Okay, if we can't agree on that, then really anybody of us here can go wherever he wants to. Sure. But let's assume, we, we assume what he says in scripture. Now, it is obvious, and there is where dogma comes in, that you can make the scripture say a lot of things. And if somebody wouldn't believe that, all you have to do is send them down the street. On the right hand, there's a Catholic church. and the left hand, there's a synagogue. A little bit farther down, a Lutheran, a kingdom hall, a Mormon temple. So obviously, you know, everybody claims to have their authority, their instruction, basically from the scripture and often plus. 
But here's the issue that even philosophy would agree to, even if we weren't to look at it religiously. Truth is one. And if the scripture is truth and non-contradictory, one thing is obvious, that although you can make the scripture say what you want, and that's proven, but you cannot get the totality of scripture to agree with whatever error is held, even so if it's called dogmatically. Destiny is the bottom line. That's the bottom line. Henry Bellows, who was a Unitarian minister of All Souls in New York City, uh, once said that truth rides a horseback. Her legs are in opposite stirrups, but her trunk is one. And I think what he's talking about is that often when you, you look at a rider on a horse, mm -hmm. you don't get to see the totality mm -hmm. of both legs on both sides of the horse and yeah. a single trunk. And mm -hmm. so we get fooled and sidetracked. Yeah. Well, let me, let me say one thing maybe, and then I'll sort of hold back a little bit and uh, sort of with the rabbi's permission, I'll go in the New Testament for a minute. <clears throat> when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man comes unto the Father but by me. If he is who he is, and he really said that, that, that rules out all other arguments. He said, I am truth. He said, if you continue in my word, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So there is truth involved, whether we call it doctrine, theology, or whatever we want to call it, call it. But scripture deals with that. We are made rational beings. We perceive truth in our mind. Then that's where it begins, and we can hear it. But then it has to really come into our very being. See, I, can, I have often said, I believe in communism. People got upset when communism was really strong. I said, just a minute, let me finish what I mean. I believe in communism because I studied Hegel, who was an idealistic philosopher. I know Lenin and, and the communistic philosophers who took the idealistic philosophy of Hegel, put it sort of upside down, and made it materialism. I know the Russians are real. I know communism is real. I come from a country that knows communism. For me to say I don't believe in communism, what it does, I would be a fool. I would close myself to life. But do I want to be a part of it? No way, not, not for a long shot. And so what we also need to realize, yes, there are people that agree to God in a general belief, and they, and they really believe what they believe. But to really know him personally, that's the ultimate. And nobody has the power to do that unless God chooses to reveal himself. And he made that very, very clear with Peter. When he said to Peter, what do the people say I am? Peter said, well, or rather to the apostles. He said, well, some say a prophet. Others say Jeremiah. Some say John the Baptist resurrected. He said, but what do you say? And Peter was the one who answered. He said, you are the Messiah, the Christ the son of the living God. And Jesus didn't say to him, well, Peter, you really paid attention. You are one of my top disciples. Those two and a half years we walked together, you observed me, you saw me pray, you saw the miracles, we slept together, we walked together, all this. That's not what he said. He said, Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal that unto you, but my Father who is in heaven. In other words, Peter couldn't even perceive in the beauty of the infallible Christ, the perfect God-man, he couldn't even really see in that revelation what it is unless God would have given it to him. This is what Jesus said. This is what I got to go by. That's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. I, just, I just would like to say something about the religious truth. Um, it has to be said real quick. Please. Okay. One minute left. <laughs> okay. Uh, religious truth implies uh, that uh, it can be proven or it can ultimately be substantiated. And to me, that takes it out of the realm of necessarily faith. Um, if we're concerned about what is authentic, uh, then I think religious truth becomes important. Mm -hmm. But uh, to most people, it seems to me, we're concerned more with what is uh, most fulfilling and most uh, genuine and meaningful for them. And authenticity might take a back seat to that for the time being. And the other thing is that I'm glad to say that conservative Judaism, which I represent, has given women a much more prominent role in uh, tradition in response to your initial uh, comment, Tanya, uh, and uh, has made women rabbis and has given women a, a much more complete role uh, or an opportunity for that role in Judaism. Well, you know, I want to thank you all. And we, uh, it's such a massive topic. It was very difficult to deal with. But mm -hmm. I think you did a, a real stand-up job in being able to bring it have people hear this kind of discussion. It's a very interesting mm -hmm. discussion. And everyone comes from such a different place. You know, it's difficult to nail down in one direction, which actually makes it a little bit more interesting mm -hmm. and a way for people to look and examine you know, these kinds of questions, which are 
difficult questions and obviously not very easily handled in the time mm. of one hour. So I want to mm. thank you all. I know it's very difficult and sometimes frustrating <laughs> at some point. Thank you. Thank but you. Thank, thank you, thank you thank Tanya. You. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, and good night. And I hope you enjoyed the program. And uh, maybe if didn't agree or did agree or at least found out something new, it was very interesting for me. I know that. Thank you. you are